My big breakthrough was while you were sleeping. Your new film, The Protégé. They didn't want to make Rush Hour at Disney because they thought Jackie Chan didn't mean much. It's so easy to kill someone's career now with like one That's right. unpopular opinion. The movie that I started shooting in Bulgaria stars Liam Neeson, Monica Bellucci, and Guy Pearce. What would it take for Armenia to have a chance to take in production jobs? There's a lot of monsters in this business. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to the private screening of your new film, The Protégé. It was absolutely fantastic. I loved it. I'm very happy you liked it. Thank I didn't you. have any doubts that I would absolutely love the film because of your track record. But I have to say, I didn't expect the feeling that I would have after watching the film when the credits came up. And the first producer name, it says Arthur Sarkeesian. And to see an Armenian name as the first producer name, it was this really overwhelming, cool feeling where I was like, wow, it's, it, it was a really proud moment. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. For many of us, Hollywood um, and that level of success that you have, it feels like such an unattainable goal. What was your big breakthrough? What was your journey? How did you get here? Uh, well, my big breakthrough um, as a project was While You Were Sleeping, the one with Sandra Bullock. I had done previous movies before that, but uh, since I was born in Iran, um, uh, obviously Armenian, um, I left when I was about 10, 11, and I was in Beirut. I went to school in Beirut. Uh, then I wanted to come to the United States to pursue film directing, and it was too far. So my parents, uh, my grandparents, they all said, no, that's too far. U.S. is 20, 24 hours, whatever. Um, maybe you should go to London. One thing led to another. I ended up in England. I went to boarding school. And then uh, my passion for film was always there since I was six, seven years old. When I saw my first actual Western that my father took me, that starred Kirk Douglas called Man Without a Star. Uh, and I was obsessed with movies. That's, that's all I thought about. I collected movie posters. Um, that's all, all I lived for. I mean, I could, wouldn't study. I was just always thinking movies and I was being kicked out of classes, school, because I didn't study much. So um, uh, that was basically my love for film. But then when I finished boarding school in England, um, I kind of got sidetracked into clothes, which was my other passion. So I started designing clothes. And then um, one thing led to another, and I met a friend of mine through him, Telly Savalas, who did the Kojak series, and he was a big, strong character actor in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he uh, basically convinced me to come to Hollywood and he introduced me to some very influential people, people that have always followed their careers. When I was young, when I was in Iran, watching their movies, whether they were producers or directors. And that's basically how the transformation came. So did you already know that you wanted to produce films or were you ever entertaining the idea of acting or directing or? Not acting because I get very nervous in front of camera, um, but definitely directing. I always had that passion. And uh, it was basically just, just loving movies. I just love movies, um, every kind, um, as long as they're well-structured and well-told. I'm driven more by story and character. So whether it's a romantic comedy or a thriller or an action comedy or even horror, uh, it's just the, the strength of the movie that drives me. So. So you came to LA. Yes. What was your first step? Oh boy. Well, my first step, um, was, let's see. Um, I wasn't really like 
getting involved, but because I knew people, um, I started just spending a lot of time with executives and reading scripts, books. Then I started optioning uh, with my own funds. I started optioning projects and developing scripts. And some worked, some didn't work, or halfway through I would give up on it because it's always been a very difficult uh, area to break through, especially for an outsider. Um, it's a very close knit, which I didn't know. And I started learning that, you know, if your cousin or your uncle or your brother or your best friend was the head of a studio or head of an agency, far bigger chance. And there's a lot of people that honestly have, and I've heard them say this, that now oh, we don't care about movies, but they're very successful because they just fell into it, which is kind of resentful because there are people out there that are so passionate and love this business or love movies and uh, they constantly fight. So I know that fight and I know the rejections, but that's just part of the journey. So my first one, my first actual step was to develop a Steve McQueen series into a movie. He did a series called Wanted Dead or Alive. He played a bounty hunter. Uh, that was basically my first big one with Rutger Hauer. And I made that. I bought the rights. I developed the script. I got the director. And uh, I made the movie for at the time. It was a company called New World Pictures. Um, which is ironic because at the time, uh, the person who was running New World Television was a guy by the name of John Feldheimer, who is now the chairman of Lionsgate, who's releasing the movie I just did. The Protégé. Yeah. To an outsider, sometimes it feels like the film industry is somewhat like a mafia. So it was one of the questions in my mind that how do you, as an immigrant, come and break through these barriers and become so successful. And it was a part of that sense of pride that I felt to see your name as the first producer name on such on a film as huge as The Protégé. It was so impressive. And it was one of, um, it was the first time I enjoyed a film that much in a long time. Thank you. So, so basically you made your transition from yes. fashion, made a lot of your relationships there. Moved right. to LA, yes. had some relationships here, but you had to go through the struggle. And yes. what were some of the obstacles that you faced in this kind of mafia-like industry? Uh, there were quite a few. Um, and uh, there was a lot of jealousy. And there was a resentment towards me. And at one point, which I will not name names, but at one point, a friend of mine had asked a very influential personal manager who represented some major names. Um, and he said, you know, why is an artist Sarkisian doing 10 movies a year? He said, he's not one of us. Uh, I never forgot that. But that, I mean, I've heard it. And uh, it is, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say mafia, but it's very close knit. And uh, if they don't want you in, there's many ways they can keep you out. But I think the bottom line is, if you have good projects, or if you have a brilliant script, and if you just don't give up, uh, they can't stop you. They can just try to beat you down. But And the other thing is, if you walk in, or if you come in with finance behind you, then you're more than welcome. And that to me as an advice to anyone that's looking into it. Uh, it's not just because if you have money, then great, you will make success, not at all, because you just have to have the um, sensibility to, to find the right material or to use the money in a sense whereby it transforms into something whereby at least it's not lost. So if you have investors, you find people that they have to, the bottom line is they have to put their trust in you because this industry, it's not something that you can hold in your hands. It's not like a piece of property. It's the person you either believe in that person or you, you don't.
at this stage in your career, do you still feel like you have to constantly prove yourself every single time? Or do you reach a stage where you feel like, okay, uh, I have an advantage in pitching my projects at this point that I didn't have maybe 10 years ago and people just like more doors open for you at this point? Um, or does it feel like a struggle every time? It, it feels like a struggle because business, the business has changed so much. Um, I mean, drastically. And uh, in what way? In, in the way that, you know, f there is the, the loyalty has gone down. 90%, I would say. Uh, there is no, I mean, in, in the days that I talked to the people, you know, guys like uh, Alan Ladd, Richard Zanuck, these guys, they said something to you, they gave you their word. If you met with them and said, you made a movie a few years ago, your studio owns the rights, I'd like to remake that or retell that. Or if they gave you your word, that was it. They just shook hands and three years later, Somebody else would go and they would say, I'm sorry, I gave my word to Robert or Arthur or Tony or whomever. That's changed a lot. It's now more corporate. It's such cutthroat. Uh, it's, it's become, it's like, it doesn't matter how many successes you have. Uh, it, it, yes, it does become a little bit easier, but by the same token, just because you've made successful movies, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, you just have carte blanche to do whatever. Again, I will keep saying, if you have a close knit tie with someone who runs a studio or makes the decisions, then you're pretty much home free. Otherwise you just struggle and you just have to not give up and uh, believe in whatever you have and push forward with your projects. Let's take a step back for a minute. Sure. A lot of people don't really understand what a film producer, TV producer, music producer, the term producer, a lot of people don't really understand what that means. Right. What does your work as a film producer entail? Well, part of uh, a producerial work is, if you are a real true producer, if you wanna be a producer, is to find the idea or the article or a book or a script um, you then put it together. You have to find the money, you have to find the director, you have to find the backer. Uh, along the lines, you may lose one and you have to replace them. And if you, you sometimes give up and you think, oh, well, you know, well, this is too difficult. I'll go after another one. Uh, it's, it comes down to belief of your um, strength and your uh, capability of whether you can get to the next step and not not kind of like give up. So uh, that's basically what what it comes down to. It's it's um, getting a whole package together, setting it up. Um, but then there's pr executive producers. I mean, it's it, you can't really describe all of them. Like what is an executive producer? An executive producer could be uh, the manager of a major star and he'll say, okay, he'll do the movie, but I want an executive producer credit. Or he could be somebody that's put up the money for the screenplay or the money for the development of a book, definitely deserves an executive producer credit. Uh, executive producers on the screen in movies aren't as important as the produced by, even though they may do all the work but that's just that difficulty of for me to explain. I could sit and explain this for three days and it, you will never get to that point of who does what. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in TV, executive producer means more than produced by. It's just the opposite. I actually saw that uh, there might be a TV adaptation of The Rush Hour, is that true? Uh, there was, unfortunately it did not work out uh, very well, so okay. um, we kind of like did it for one season and it didn't work and uh, even though it was pretty good, but I don't think you can replace Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. They have a chemistry, it's like Robert Redford and Paul Newman 
It's Bud Abbott and Lou Costello, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby. There is chemistry that works. You can't build it or it won't. And a lot of people have tried to put duos together to, to catch the same, that they had that same lightning in a bottle. But that either happens or doesn't. Uh, and they didn't have that chemistry together. Um, unfortunately, didn't work out. But I'm uh, hoping that number four will be out soon. Do you like working in TV? I like TV. It's much faster. Um, but I, I don't mind it at all. I, I, I actually, uh, lately, because, you know, I've come, I've come across books and stuff that it's, uh, you can't tell a story in two hours, which relates itself much more to a limited series. And from that sense, I'm very grateful to the Amazons and Netflix because uh, uh, they don't hold you back. Network, there's certain things they can do and they can't do. They soften something up because they can't be explicit, but uh, that's why I like, I like to explore the streaming world of the Amazons and the Netflixes. Do you have a story of your own that you would really like to tell? Uh, I would, could probably go to sleep and wake up thinking about something, and I would try to build that in my mind if it's something that could work, or if it will fit the market, or would it be too uh, kind of personal? I don't know, I mean, I have, yes, I've had things that happened to me in my life that I may want to explore as a biography, but without using myself. Mm. Um, and um, also some of the things that I want to explore is the, and not because I want it to be political, but the Armenian genocide, which I don't think was ever told right. Um, there were a couple of books that were never allowed to be made into film. I'm still thinking about them, and there's one particular project that I'm working on, which I think would be a terrific drama that I'm hoping I can get to the screen within the next year. What are your criticisms of how so far the Armenian genocide has been portrayed in film? Um, it's simple because everybody's tried to soften it and no one has ever shown what truly happened. And I understand, I mean, if you look back at the history of a book called The 40 Days of Musada, uh, that book was blocked in so many ways that didn't make the screen to the screen, and there were some major names involved, like major movie names, uh, actor-wise, director-wise, producer-wise, writer-wise. Even Kirk, who owned, obviously, MGM, and MGM owned that book for years, um, there were significant barriers that is very political. But I was hoping that, you know, somebody would be able to the promise got pretty close, but it was not what, I wish it was better told. Um, and um, anyway, it's one of the things with movies, you, everybody goes out knowing that they're gonna make the best movie possible and sometimes, unfortunately, certain things don't work. Um, I think Christian Bale was great, uh, the cast was great, but uh, I just wanted, maybe it's, because I'm in love with that book, 40 Days of Mossadegh, so much that I don't see anything else. But I think it could be told much better, especially now that it's been recognized that it has been, it, it was a genocide. Um, but uh, as I say, it's just, they, there's been people that have been very careful to tread that ground very slowly and softly and so if this is something that you decide to move forward with, it'll technically be very risky for your career. It could be, yeah, but I'm either going to do it right mm -hmm. uh, and truthful, factual, what it was, or mm -hmm. I, I don't want to, I don't want to kind of like, you know, cover it up with uh, mm -hmm. colors. So what components need to come in place for you to be able to create a film like that 
that you would be proud 40 of? 40 days, uh, it would be the director. That would have to be someone that has no fear. The writer and uh, the, the money guys who put up the money and the studio that will distribute it. Mm-hmm. It's all a matter of, okay, if we're going to do it, we do it right. This mm-hmm. is what happened or we don't. Would the first step be the writer to make sure that the you have... The first step would be... Well, it's it's tricky because, okay, if you get the writer, the writer says, well, who's going to put up the money? and Or who's directing it? It's just difficult. It's just, you just have to... I've been, mm-hmm. you know, fighting on that for a long time to try and get the rights. And that's got its own complications mm-hmm. with, with the company that owns the rights. And I don't know whether it's political or not, but I don't know. Mm. But this other one that I'm concentrating on is uh, just as good. So we'll see. Yeah. I imagine that would be the most difficult part that film production is such a collaborative process that you can be so passionate about your idea and you can be so sure about your project, but there are all of these other people that you have to collaborate with. What do, what do you find is the most frustrating part of film production and that whole collaborative process? Um, the most frustrating is when you really believe in something and you have to convince whoever that person is that, hey, it's great, you've got to do it. Now, you may get lucky, you get your director says, now I love this. The actor says, I love this. Uh, the studio says, You know, no, I think you need to change this, that, the other. You have to rewrite it. Sometimes you go along with that. And most of the time, if your instinct tells you no, then it's no. So they put an intern around or they say, we can't make it. Like it happened with me on Rush Hour. They didn't want to make Rush Hour at Disney because they thought Jackie Chan didn't mean much. And I said, okay, so you can give it back to me. And the uh, new line made the movie. Um, so it's, y- you never know. If anybody tells you that they, they know exactly what movies work, they're full of it. Yeah. Yeah, don't, don't, don't believe that. Okay, but you must have some sort of a formula for success. You have some secret because you managed to become successful in the fashion industry and in the film industry in two different countries that are very competitive. So what is your secret? Honestly... I just have so much passion for what I do. Even if it's, if it's clothes, I would, I mean, I sit and I think colors and I always did that. Or I would take a suit from a manufacturer and I would say, you know, if this was made in flannel with a corduroy uh, waistcoat, would probably work or I'd put piping on it. This is back in the 70s. And I did that and it was just really my taste. It was nothing else. I and didn't, you modeled your own clothing And I modeled well. my own clothes. Um, my manager who, uh, because I started the clothing just by accident. I was buying a lot of clothes from a store in London. And the manager said, you, you spend so much money buying clothes. Why don't you open your own place? I said, but I don't know anything about, you know, this kind of stuff, tailoring. And he said, well, I will leave and I will come and open it with you. I said, okay, look, the only thing I'm going to do is I'm only going to go and find in that boutique and put in that boutique everything that I like. If I don't like it and if somebody tells me, yeah, but, you know, this will sell because that's what sells, I'm not interested. It's just going to be my taste. And if people like it, great. If not, and uh, that's how Vinci started and it became really, really successful and I was it was way above my head. I was too young. Um, How old were you? I was, when I started, I was 23. Wow. Um, and um, I literally had, I mean, everybody that was anybody. Uh, the royal families from Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. I mean, everybody. Wow. Uh, Americans, business people. Um, and I was just this 23-year-old that looked at it like this is a hobby. I love clothes. It wasn't a business. I didn't get into it saying, hey, I'm going to make some money and all that. It just happened. And it was, Mm -hmm. everybody was coming telling me, uh, you know, we've heard about Vinci. We've heard about this. We've heard about your store. 
even my customers would come and hang out on a Saturday and have mm. their cappuccinos or coffees and just hang out with me. But I, was, I was just not, mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't a businessman. I was just creating and loving colors and putting things together. It's, it was passion. That's what it is. It's the same thing with, with scripts. You read something, you fall in love with it. Um, you just have to follow what you love. It's so interesting you say that because I really think anything great, anything that creates a huge impact always starts with passion. And it seems to be that it's you don't really think about the financial aspect of it when you're trying to create something great. I've had this conversation with my husband because I told him that I think one of your greatest advantages in creating music is that you're not doing it to play at weddings. Armenian music industry isn't really a money-making music right. industry unless you're playing weddings and things right. like that. So you either do it because you love it or you do it because you're trying to make money and be a wedding singer or right. something, right? So I really think that's what creates something unique and is really amazing in art when you're not actually thinking about catering to a crowd. You're doing it for yourself Very out of true. your own love and out of your own passion. And so... For you, whether it be the fashion industry or whether it be the film industry, it was just purely out of your love and your passion yes. for those things. And you became successful in both. I think that's such an inspiring um, lesson in life. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is. It has nothing to do with, uh, like you said, you know, it's, it's got nothing to do with, OK, this is either you do it because you love it. And if you're thinking at a different angle, then then that's fine, too, if that's the angle you're thinking. And then you've got to find that avenue and that area where you know you can get there. So, I mean, I as I said, you know, when I was when I was doing it, I was so successful at what I was doing with my clothing. I didn't even look at some people, very close people to me that were saying, Arthur, this is a gold mine. You have a gold mine. I didn't I didn't it didn't capture me. I said, hey, I, don't, I don't know what you mean, it's a gold mine. I said, well, look, uh, you know, I mean, they were more interested asking my manager what my business took that week than I was pursuing to try and find out, honestly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I made mistakes along the way. I trusted the wrong people, but that happens. What did that bring you to, trusting the wrong people? Uh, trusting the wrong people brought me a lot of heartache. Mm. Um, a lot of uh, loss of, uh, what's the word, believing in people or trusting people. And I was extremely trustworthy. I still am. But I lost that business because of trusting the wrong people who were very close to me. So it's a, it's a world where you just have to be, you know, open. Your eyes have to be open and, and, and know where you're threading. But if you've got a clean heart, you're approaching somebody, something with a clean heart. You can't think. You can't think, oh, you know, somebody's going to come and screw me or do this, that, the other. But it happens. Mm -hmm. You've also had two significant people, it sounds like, in your life who actually helped open doors into the world that uh, you entered in fashion. It was that man that you mentioned yes. whose store you would go to and yes. then you started together. And then in the film industry, you had someone yes. who um, who kind of introduced you to that world and, and right. uh, inspired you to move to Los Angeles, yes. right? So how important of a role do you feel like they played in your life and how has that affected you? Do you now feel like you want to do that for other people? How does... That I will, you. Um, I will always put myself out to help whoever I can. Um, that's just a, a given that I will do no matter what. Um, yes, my uh, the clothing side from this guy was just he was looking for leaving that job. And I was I just happened to have been the right place, the right, right, right time at the right place. But I, again, you know, it wasn't uh, like premeditated or I plan, oh, I'm going to go get him. He's going to come with me. I'm going to open this store. It's going to be successful. I knew nothing. I just just wanted to 
wear my clothes. And uh, when I came to the States, uh, the person that influenced me an enormous amount was a gentleman by the name of Howard Koch, who was one of the most well-respected people I have ever met in this industry. I mean, his word was as good as gold. Uh, he had ran Paramount Pictures, was head of production. He ran Frank Sinatra's company. And he kind of took me under his wings and I learned a lot from him. I, what I learned from him was also a lot of, you know, you give your word, you keep your word with, with projects, whatever. Um, he's just a nice man and it was, I was very lucky to, to be around him. But there's a lot of monsters in this business. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a vicious industry. Yeah. It is. It, it, it has a lot to do, I think, you know, with, a lot of it has to do with upbringing too because you find people that come, and that doesn't mean, I don't mean to be you know, disrespectful, but coming from the ground up, they are trained in a way to always be on a defensive. So they always attack you or always are, have angles. And there are people that have no angles and they go in open-heartedly and these two sometimes don't mix. Uh, did those experiences contribute to you wanting to start your own production company? Um, well, my own production company I started because I just basically wanted to develop as many projects as I could and be my own uh, boss and not work for anyone. That's why I've never had a partner, although it's not a bad thing to have a partner because sometimes you just can't handle everything yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but my production company is just, okay, I'm going to develop six, seven, eight, nine, ten projects and I'll see which ones I can get in front of the camera. Uh, there's some stuff that I've done from years ago that I still love, but it hasn't happened. Yeah. So, but I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep trying. Mm -hmm. A lot of production companies have been outsourcing to other countries uh, because it's cheaper, frankly, to shoot in some places. And a lot of countries have benefited from this, like Croatia, for example. Right. Um, Game of Thrones made Croatia such a hot spot for tourism. Right. What would it take for Armenia uh, to have a chance to take in production jobs? They have, they have to incentivize producers and companies to go there and shoot movies. They also have to have the craftsmanship, which Armenians are extremely good with their hands. I mean, they're the best. Um, so it, it will come down to tax credits. It'll come down to as much incentive as you can give. And of course, locations mean a lot. Um, you can't duplicate, you know, New York, for example. But, you know, if you're clever, and if you've got a movie uh, that say it has a 12 week shoot, um, a lot of it is interiors and you have some fantastic sound stages in Armenia mm. that you can shoot on the sound stage and then do your exterior work in New York for two weeks. People would, uh, they do that all the time. I did mm. that with uh, uh, the protege was shot in Romania mm. and parts of it you believe, you think that you're in Thailand, you're not, you're in Romania. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, yeah, and you, London, we were in London because of the Hyde Park thing, mm -hmm. but there are parts of like the bookstore in the movie, if you remember that, that is a street in Romania, in, oh, in Bucharest. Wow. But we dressed it up and so you just have a great production designer. Hmm. Um, as you said, it's it's a very collaborative business. It's one thing to get started, but then any anything could go wrong. So to make Armenia attractive, Armenia, yes, they should they, they should definitely bring a lot of financial incentives and have the the crew to back it up. Sound stages. I mean, if they're equipped, like you said, Croatia is, Bulgaria is, Romania is. There's no reason at all for people not to shoot the. Oh, that's interesting. I have never been there, but I'm, I'm dying to go. Do you have any plans to go? I'm planning for, uh, let's see, they told me the best time to go is September. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can this September, if I'm not, I don't think I'll be working. I may be, I don't know. If not, I'm definitely going to go.
my dad's going to be there in September. Oh, yeah? Yeah. So, so if you go, oh, then good. definitely you'll have to go visit our winery. Oh, fantastic. And yeah, and I have to, I have to plan your itinerary because okay. I feel like I'm a pro now with all of the places to go in Great. Armenia, especially outside of Yerevan, outside uh -huh. of the capital. There's some gorgeous, gorgeous places That's that you have to see. That's what I want. I want to see all these gorgeous places because it will also give me a lot of ideas of, you know, yeah. to, for movie wise or whatever. But I also, um, I mean, I love wine. I've been collecting wine for 25 years. Oh, really? Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, so definitely I'd love to be there. Okay, you're, you're going to go wine tasting okay, in our winery. Right. Yeah, it'll Fantastic. be so much fun. Oh, I wish I could be there. Hopefully I could be there. Yeah, September. Let's see. What are your plans in your career for, let's say, the next five years? What are the goals that you have in um, mind that you would really like to achieve? I like to get Rush Hour 4 made, mm -hmm. for sure. I have a few other projects that are very dear to me. Um, one of them is this courtroom drama that is the aftermath of the genocide, which I believe in and by itself is a terrific thriller. A um, few others. I, um, I'm hoping that I can find something that is very special for me to finally direct, which I don't want to sound, uh, you know, kind of uh, cocky, but I do want to do that. But it's got to be something that I feel I can do. Uh, just that I want to become a director is not in my my realm, in my world. But if I find something that I think I can tell the story, you know, you need you need a great editor, a great DP, a great storyboarder, um, and a story that you feel that can come out of you. I've seen enough movies mm -hmm. to to, you know, feel okay, well I think I can do that. So that's one of my dreams. And uh, I have not kind of let go of designing. But that's, again, you know, I had a couple of friends of mine tell me, look, why don't you do a line of clothing? I could do a line of clothing in a week, but I can't own a boutique or stand there and do all of that. So, you know, if it ever happened that somebody mm -hmm. came up to me and told me, do you want to do a line of clothing for men? I would definitely have that awakened again in me because I've always loved clothes. I'm just open. I'm open to whatever's out there. Can you mention the movie that you will be shooting in Bulgaria or not yet? Um, well, the movie, yes, I can. The movie that I started shooting in Bulgaria, uh, started on the 13th of April, is called Memory of a Killer, which stars Liam Neeson, Monica Bellucci, and Guy Pearce. And this was a movie that uh, was based on a Dutch movie made in 2003. A friend of mine brought me the movie a few years ago, um, watched it, and I thought it was terrific. I gave it to a very dear, close director friend of mine, Martin Campbell, who did The Protégé with me and The Foreigner. And he thought it was a terrific script. I'm sorry, a terrific movie. We then developed it. Uh, two, three years and now he's shooting that, he's finishing it within the next two weeks. That's also quite the cast. Are you involved in the casting? Uh, yes, I was involved with when originally when we put it together, we, Martin and I were talking about, it was supposed to be a TV series mm -hmm. uh, uh, as a limited series. Then it was supposed to be a network, which didn't work out. So we went the feature route. Um, and Liam was one of the people that was on um, our mind. Uh, but on, on a day-to-day -day basis, I haven't been involved with it. I don't need to. I'm not the type of a producer that has to sit there and do the nuts and bolts. That's one part I can't stand. You're able to let go of you, all of Absolutely. The... You have okay. to. Because once a director takes over, mm -hmm. it's the director's medium. That, that's what it is. Sitting there as a producer and being a nudge, you know, oh, you should do this, you should look at this, what about that? I mean, it's all such BS that I just have no respect for people who do that because they try to show that they are there and they're controlling. <laughs> you put your crew together, you know what you're doing, 
you've got a great script, you've got a director who knows what he's doing, you've got a great crew, leave them alone, just watch from afar. I mean, even if I'm on the set, I'm not on the set that much. Mm. I don't need to be. But you have line producers who do that. Yeah. You know, you reminded me actually, now it's kind of an interesting time in Hollywood. It started perhaps with a Me Too movement and then we kind of got into cancel culture. There's so much pressure now in the film industry and there seem to be so many rules. I imagine that would be a little bit of an infr infringement on the creative process. Do you feel that? Absolutely. It's a huge infringement. Um, it's a huge infringement. Uh, it has made me very angry for certain reasons because, I mean, everybody has something to say and you have to watch, you have to, if you look back at some of these movies, even in the early 90s or let's go further back, 70s, 80s, 60s, there is no way you can say the things they said today. And it's just, it's just changed to what you want to do. If you have a script that is true to what it is, to the story, you go out, you're gonna to be told today, uh, Arthur, you can't do this, you can't do that. You can't. Well, uh, that's changing it. It doesn't mean that you're being nasty or you want to, you, you're, you're racist or you're this, you're that, nothing at all. It just, they just have so much, they're suddenly has so much control and I'm, I'm just unfortunately very much against this can uh, culture cancel BS. It really has bothered me. Uh, every Tom, Dick and Harry has got something to say and, and everybody's abiding by it because everybody's running scared, lawsuits and this like that. So really, it's not pleasant. It was so much more pleasant years ago. So I hope, you know, some people stand up. I hope some people fight against it. I hope it doesn't turn into a mishmash because right now, I mean, the quality of some of the movies made are just absolute garbage. I agree. Is there a platform for, uh, for filmmakers who actually want to keep the creative process now? Because I know that if you don't abide by certain rules, for example, you can't, uh, your film can't be at the Oscars anymore. Right. If you're not following this, the right. criteria that they have set forth, which that criteria seems really bizarre to me, because if you're, you know, shooting a film about Ukraine, right. you can't meet a lot of that criteria. But right. does that mean that film shouldn't be made and shouldn't have a chance at the Oscars? I mean, it's no, it's 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 really crazy. I mean, I was so shocked by watching the I didn't even watch the Oscars this year. Neither did I. I mean, you know, honestly, you go back and watch the Academy Awards from when Bob Hope did it, or it's not that I'm old school, but maybe I am, but they were, you know, you watched shows. There were jokes, there were roasts, there were this. You can't do any of that today. Somebody was gonna get up and, um, and next thing you know, there's an article in the newspaper and you may have done nothing. You may have just said one word and suddenly the whole town is against you and everybody's running scared because they're all just chicken. Yeah. And I don't like that. Yeah, and especially because it's such a competitive industry and because uh, because it's largely based around relationships, as you've said, it's so easy to kill someone's career now with like one That's right. unpopular opinion or one incident. You Absolutely. can just bury a person's career. Absolutely, you can. And they may not even, uh, you know, they may have not done anything at all or if they've done something minor by, whatever it is, they turn it into such a big issue because there are people that have, as, as you know, they've come from this world of uh, culture cancel and this one and that one, and we gotta go back. I mean, going back, they don't want to cancel Gone with the Wind, take it off. Are you stupid? I mean, I've heard things, Sleeping Beauty I heard, with the, I, I mean, it's just, I'm sorry, I, it's just bullshit. And I am not, I, I would not, under any circumstances, be want, to, want to be involved in an industry where, where you have to watch every step you take because it's, it's not that anymore. But what are you gonna do? I mean, who's gonna make Dog Day Afternoon today? 
it's Midnight Cowboy. I mean, these are brilliant, brilliant movies. And I don't think filmmakers like Scorsese or Spielberg or anybody, even young ones coming up, I think what they see and what they have done and what they know that you can do, I don't think they're going to end up in this, you know, this hole or, okay, I'm a puppet, push me any way you want. You won't have anything. They won't have movies. You'll have pure garbage. I agree. So I hope it doesn't happen. Yeah, same here. Same here. For someone who wants to follow in your footsteps, what's one practical piece of advice that you would give? Um, be persistent. I know you've heard this before about not giving up, but truly, don't give up. You just never know. But to allow other people to influence you or to stop you, to put a barrier up, and there will be, these are things that you have to bear in mind. You make up your mind, whether it's a movie project, whether it's a piece of clothing you want to design, whether it's a st structural thing you want to build, whatever it is, you just have to stick to it. And God willing, it will happen. But if it doesn't, at least you won't regret not doing it. For, for someone who doesn't have any relationships in the industry, who doesn't have any kind of financial backing and just wants to start um, not knowing what the first step is to take, yeah. what, what do you think they should do? Well, if I'm around, I'll guide them. Um, they should, I mean, they should read as much as they can. They should look at articles. They should look at interviews. They should look at history of people that started with nothing or came from nowhere or had difficulties. And there are hundreds of books like that, producers, directors. I'm just talking about the movie business, um, actors. Um, and it's the ability that they have within themselves to feel, okay, I don't know anything. I'm just starting, but I don't give a flying, you know, I'm not going to use it, <laughs> but I'm going to do it. And I'm going to keep on until I succeed. It's simple to say, difficult, but that's what separates people who have the stamina and the strength and those who say, oh, you know what, it's too, too tough. I don't want to do this. I think that's great advice. And I really have noticed that pattern in... Um in all of my friends that have become successful, the not giving up. It sounds cliche yeah, sometimes, but it's, but it's true. It's, not, it's, it's so, so true. It's so true. It's like, you know, um, like the boxing stand when you keep hitting and it keeps bouncing back, it will never go down. Finally, it stands up. It's in your hands. <laughs>